ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, could I please have your attention, please? Um, my name is Mark Cameron. I work at uh, Jaguar Land Rover, and obviously very proud to be supporting and working alongside the Royal Geographical Society with I IBG um, for what it promises to be a fantastic evening um, for the next hour or so. Um, I look after our partnerships and our sponsorships at uh, Jaguar Land Rover, and for me, this is one of the most uh, special of those because. Uh, it gives us the ability, ability to work really in the heart of geography um, to bring our brand in association with some fantastic work that goes on around the world. And, and actually, next year will be the 10th anniversary um, of, of the Land Rover anniversary. Um, so a very warm welcome um, here um, to, uh, to all of you. Um, and it's great to see such a, a large and vibrant audience. You really are in for a treat this evening. Uh, this is actually a unique lecture. Um, and it's an opportunity for Tom Allen uh, to share with you what he and his team have been up to last year as recipients of the 2016 Land Rover bursary. And I was reflecting before this evening um, on some words that uh, Tom had written back in April last year before they set off on the expedition. He, and I quote, the goal is to develop safe, sustainable and spectacular backcountry routes through the region beginning with a little idea called the Trans-Caucasian Trail. Being able to spread those messages far and wide through the bursary partnership is, to my mind, every bit as helpful to that goal as the physical and financial components of the grant, if not more so. Well, Tom, this is your opportunity to spread those messages here this evening. So please, can you all welcome to the stage Tom Allen. pressure then. <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to start with a little bit of audience participation. How does everyone feel about that? <laughs> okay, put up your hands if you've heard of the Caucasus. All right. Now keep, keep your hands up if you could point the Caucasus out on a map. I think I've chosen the wrong crowd for this. So the point, I mean, this is the Royal Geographical Society, of course, but the point is that very few people actually know where the Caucasus is. Um, it's a very overlooked part of the world. And I've got a very personal connection uh, to the Caucasus, uh, and it started back in 2007. Uh, it was winter, and I'd spent half a year uh, riding a bicycle 5,000 miles across Europe as part of a heroic mission to try and cycle around the world. Um, Yes, I really did look that ridiculous. <clears throat> and I'd been pedaling through rain and snow along the Black Sea coast of Turkey for what seemed like weeks, and I was desperate to try and to find somewhere warm, dry, and cozy to celebrate Christmas. And I'd heard that Georgia was a Christian nation. So I'd been pedaling miserable long nights uh, to cross the border before the 25th of December. So Imagine my horror when I pedaled triumphantly into Georgia on Christmas Eve to be told that the Georgian church followed the Orthodox calendar <laughs> and wouldn't be celebrating Christmas for another two weeks. <laughs> anyway, I, I continued pedaling across Georgia to Tbilisi, uh, the capital, and then south into Armenia. Uh, this was the coldest winter in living memory. It was down to minus 25 at night. Um, Thankfully, I spent most of my nights in the homes of local people who were hands down the most hospitable I've met since leaving England. And through these experiences, I started to feel a strange sense of affinity uh, with the Caucasus. There was something about these people huddled away in these mountains, uh, overlooked by the world, having endured some truly desperate times since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, yet they were still practicing and preserving this diverse spread of unique custom, customs and traditions, and all among some of the most spectacular landscapes I'd ever seen. And that affinity became a lot more tangible when on my way through Yerevan, I met a beautiful Armenian girl. <coughs> Before I knew it, my round-the-world bike ride had been put on hold, and the Caucasus had become my new home. Two years later, we were married. <coughs> We, st we still are, I should, I should add. 
Nice story, but what the hell has this got to do with Land Rover, I hear you ask? Uh, more to the point, what has it got to do with this Transcaucasian Trail thing I keep hearing about? So let's fast forward to 2015. Uh, and after a few years based in the UK, I decided to, me and my wife decided to move back to Yerevan. But as much as I loved living in Armenia, and I, I really did love living there, I had this problem. Uh, whenever I was there, I felt somehow disconnected, almost purposeless. In the UK, I can stand up here and say that I'm a travel writer, adventure filmmaker, and reluctant public speaker. And people kind of understand what that means. Uh, but when I'm in Yerevan, I'm just a random foreigner with a silly haircut speaking bad Armenian who can never explain what he does for a living. <laughs> uh, not just that, but my work had no real connection to the place I was living in. I wanted to do something good for the Caucasus, this place that had come to mean so much to me. So I knew something had to change, but I didn't know what. One thing I did know was that for years I'd been dreaming of hiking the length of Armenia. But for many reasons I hadn't yet done so. The best maps of the region were made by the Soviet military in the 70s and were a little bit out of date. Hiking infrastructure as we understood it uh, was non-existent. Not just no maps but also no trails. Very little information on where to go hiking and no real visible culture of the outdoors at all. So to go off hiking you either had to know the right people or hire a guide. <coughs> I'd always felt this was a real shame because the Caucasus was potentially an adventure traveler's paradise. The Caucasus Mountains cover an area bigger and taller than the Alps, including Europe's highest mountain, Mount Elbrus. They're also one of 34 global biodiversity hotspots with everything from rainforest to steppe to alpine peaks. Uh, you've got wolves, bears, lynx, even the Caucasian leopard makes its home here. It's, it's also a gold mine for history fans. Two million year old skulls were recently discovered in Georgia. Armenia lays claim to being the first official Christian nation in 301 AD. And the region is even cited as the birthplace of wine more than 8,000 years ago. Well, thanks for that. <laughs> Nice story, but where exactly is the Caucasus again? Okay, this is the RGS, so you're supposed to know. But um, just in case you don't, I've put together a handy map. This is the UK, in case you needed reminding. And this thing next to it, that's the European Union, remember that? <laughs> um, and here's the Caucasus. <clears throat> and within the region, you've got the Greater Caucasus Mountains, also just known as the Caucasus Mountains and the Lesser Caucasus Mountains, which run from the Black Sea down to the southern border of Armenia uh, and Iran. Politically, you've got three relatively newly independent nations in the Caucasus, uh, the post-Soviet republics of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. This region is also sometimes known as the South Caucasus or the Trans-Caucasus, uh, especially in a, in a Russian context. And many of the people who live there have their own uh, traditional names for various parts of the region as well. Anyway, I decided in 2015 I was going to finally do it. I was going to hike the length of Armenia. And I plotted out a route with the Soviet maps and Google Earth. And one summer's day in June 2015, off I went. And perhaps it was just being on my own, but something about the hike felt a little bit futile. I knew that I could do it because I spent years living outdoors on far more challenging journeys all over the world. And it wouldn't resolve the issue of finding something meaningful to do in the Caucasus. It would just be fodder for a few more blog posts. Then I met a Frenchman called Terry. Terry had spent two and a half years walking from France to Armenia and was on his way to Iran. He carried almost no baggage. His toes were poking out of his trainers and, uh, trainers and, he, and he chain smoked constantly. <laughs> and he had an even sillier beard than me. Anyway, I was talking to him about all of this uh, and about feeling disillusioned and needing, to get, needing something to get my teeth into and whinging about how little information there was and all of that. And he said, well, why don't you publish your route so that other people can hike it? And a light bulb actually appeared above my head. See? 
Yes, I would build the Trans-Armenian Trail. No, 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 scrap that. I would build the Trans-Caucasian Trail. I had sudden visions of this epic journey that would follow the greater Anessa Caucasus from Russia through Georgia and Armenia and even into Iran, connecting the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and creating this incredible opportunity for other people to, to discover this wonderful part of the world. It was the strangest moment, as if the idea had been floating around and had just dropped into my head. I didn't have the foggiest idea how I'd do it, of course, but that didn't seem to matter. <clears throat> and around this time, autumn 2015, I popped back over to the UK for uh, an event called Explore, which is the UK's biggest fieldwork and expeditions conference held in this very building, the RGS. If anyone uh, could advise me on making this dream a reality, they would probably be at Explore. Well, why didn't you apply for the Land Rover bursary, somebody said. A four by four would probably come in pretty useful. And it did make total sense. Uh, the Caucasus is covered with this informal network of dirt tracks. Most of these date, uh, date back to the Soviet times. Apparently, the result of a calculation someone made that it was cheaper to mass produce four by fours than to build actual roads. <coughs> and um, I suspected these old dirt roads would form much of the backbone of the Transcaucasian Trail, and having a Land Rover to map them all out would be a godsend. So I threw together a proposal to meet the November deadline and promptly forgot all about it. Two months later, after the most nerve-wracking interview of my life, I got a call to say that I was the winner of the 2016 Land Rover bursary. <clears throat> I, I recruited... I recruited Alessandro, uh, who's a digital mapping enthusiast who I'd met in Yerevan. And in April last year, I drove a brand new Land Rover Defender called Georgina away from the gates of this very building, thinking, shit, now I'm actually going to have to do it. <laughs> uh, we drove across Europe, and a little over a week later, we crossed the border into Georgia. The very same border, actually, that I'd crossed in 2007 in search of Christmas. Uh, the journey that had taken me half a year by bicycle had taken just nine days, which is a nice reminder the Caucasus isn't that far away. <clears throat> now, it, it's not a new idea, creating a long-distance hiking route. Um, such things serve this kind of primal need that we all have to go out and to explore. Let's not forget that our ancestors colonized every corner of the globe by walking. Um, religion created a new name for the long-distance hike, the pilgrimage. And with it, what I think is the world's longest, uh, sorry, the world's oldest continuously used hiking trail, the Camino de Santiago, which is more than a thousand years old. Um, the age of industrializ uh, industrialization changed things a bit. Walking was no longer necessary. We became passengers and machine operators. And so walking was repurposed for recreation, travel, and adventure. Um, and as the demand for this grew, we started molding our world around this need. In 1932, uh, there was the UK's uh, Kinder Mass Trespass, in which workers from the industrial Midlands took to the Peak District to protest for the right to roam. And that's since been called the most successful direct action in British history. And it's widely credited with the establishment of the UK's national park system and the UK's very first national trail, the Pennine Way. Around the same time, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, volunteers were right in the middle of building something that was going to become called the Appalachian Trail. Uh, which is now considered to be the longest walking only hiking trail in the world, uh, which stretches 2,200 miles through 14 states in the eastern US. And the information age only seems to have magnified this desire to travel by foot. The Appalachian Trail Conservancy reckons that more than 2 million people a year do at least one day of hiking on the Appalachian Trail. And the figures from the Camino, uh, Camino de Santiago, are even more astonishing. In 1986, 1,801 pilgrims registered their arrival at the Shrine of St. James. In 2016, 
277,915 people did the same thing. So that's a 15,000% increase in a single generation. And nine out of 10 of them were doing it for non-religious reasons. So that's a hell of an appetite that we're developing for lo uh, long walking journeys. I don't really need to explain this to this audience. I, right from where I'm sitting, I can see someone who spent one and a half years walking across Europe, uh, a guy who did a lap of the Middle East on foot, um, the guy who led the longest polar journey in history. Um, and, but anyway, while these people might have individual reasons for making their journeys, I'm sure they'd all agree that there are few easier ways to unify the mind, body, and the universe than by traveling on foot. Or in other words, who hasn't felt better after a nice long walk in the country? Even the Transcaucasian Trail wasn't a new idea. In fact, when I tried to register transcaucasiantrail.com, I discovered someone had already bought it. <coughs> and it took me about five minutes to do what the KGB would have needed a major international spying operation to do. I looked up the domain registration records, found the name and the email address of the owner, plugged them into Facebook, and found a guy called Paul Stevens. <laughs> now, Paul was, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know how that got in there. Um, <clears throat> Paul really likes kittens. Now, Paul had been a Peace Corps volunteer in Georgia, and after his posting had finished, he'd stayed there, and it turned out that he'd been thinking about a similar trail uh, across the Greater Caucasus through Georgia and Azerbaijan. So little had, not, little had I known that while I'd been searching for a north-south hiking route in Armenia, Paul had been doing exactly the same thing from east to west in Georgia. So it quickly became clear that we should be building two trails. Paul concentrating on the Greater Caucasus and I would uh, work on the Lesser Caucasus, about which a lot less is actually known. <coughs> And under the single brand of the Transcaucasian Trail, <laughs> the project as a whole act as a flagship for a hiking and ecotourism revival across the Caucasus, or so we hoped. And so the Transcaucasian Expedition was off to a flying start. We were in the Caucasus at the start of the hiking season with a flipping awesome Land Rover and a budget to take us through to the end of the year. Our goal was very simple, to scout and map a prototype hiking route the length of the Lesser Caucasus. And we decided to start in the, in the south of Armenia, at the Iranian border, which would be the, uh, the obvious southern terminus of the trail. This is the province of Sunik, which despite its incredible landscapes, uh, less than 2% of visitors to Armenia make it this far south. And with so little known about the region, uh, the early days of the expedition involved a lot of detective work. We wanted to identify what trails already existed in the hope that we could link them together to create a single route. So our first ports of call were always the villages. And the last census of Armenia reported that nearly half the population worked in agriculture. So that's, that's a huge number of people who know their environment intimately. But getting at this local knowledge was not always as simple as getting out a map and asking people to draw on it. In fact, most people had never even seen a map of their surroundings. And we also had to think really hard about how to phrase our questions. Asking what the nicest route was in a country with no hiking culture wasn't very successful. So instead, we would ask, how do you get to the next village by horse? Or which paths do people use for gathering mushrooms or berries? Or how, how would you get to this remote church in, in the forest? And it was nice because people's schedules were flexible in a way that we're completely unaccustomed to here in the West. <clears throat> it was great for us. It meant people were usually ready to drop everything and engage with us. And this worked both ways, of course, because if there's one thing the Caucasian people love, it's having people over for a feast and getting horribly drunk. Now, I can't go any further without introducing Vargan. Uh, we'd been in touch before the expedition began, but when we arrived in the Caucasus, we still didn't have a native team member. Uh, this would be important for a few reasons. Uh, obviously, to have someone who knew the language 
but also because I didn't want this to be one of those idealistic foreigner shows up and tells the locals how it's done kind of, kind of things. In fact, what I really wanted to do was set the idea in motion and let local people carry it on. Anyway, <clears throat> as soon as he heard we were on our way in a flashy Land Rover, Varhagen dropped everything to join the team full time. <laughs> I have no idea how that got in there, sorry. <clears throat> He's a, a natural outdoorsman, fantastic communicator and bridge builder with local people. And I thought it was fantastic that he believed so strongly in this Transcaucasian trail idea that he would quit a paid job in a nature reserve to work voluntarily for the whole summer. And in retrospect, I honestly can't imagine how we'd have got through the year without him. So, research done. It was time to go exploring. This was the meat of the expedition, exploring and mapping out the prototype route for the trail. Now, I've, I've had my fair share of adventures, but designing an experience for someone else was something that I'd never done before. And there's, there's certain obvious things that a hiking trail needs. You need regular access to water, and supplies, you need a route that's safe and navigable and places to stop for the night. But there are also uh, many less obvious things to consider. You know, while panoramic views like this are great, uh, too many ups and downs would become really frustrating. And the odd long days uh, hiking here and there would be acceptable, but too many in a row would wear people out. Uh, historical sites would add a lot to the experience but too many huge detours and people would just modify the route to avoid them. And there's even less obvious things like whether a mountain spring flowed permanently or just seasonally, and things like how the length of the grass would affect trail visibility as it grew over the course of a year. So there's a lot to think about, and it was very rare that we'd find the perfect route first time round. It usually took two or three passes to, to reach an acceptable balance. <coughs> Georgina really came into her own at uh, this point. She'd been customised by some very, very clever people at Land Rover's Special Vehicle Operations Division uh, based on our plans to have a mobile base camp with the latest GIS technology. Which sounds very fancy, it's mostly about being able to plug our phones in somewhere. But um, it really did transform what we could accomplish. We would, we would set off on foot each morning, armed with our GPS gear and cameras, and after a long day in the mountains, we'd see the lights of Georgina, driven by Alessandro to a pre-arranged pickup point where we could set up camp and go over the day's findings. Georgina even had a fridge in which we could store <coughs> cold, refreshing beverages, <laughs> like fruit juice. Not just that, but having essentially a workplace on wheels meant that we could t uh, tell the story of the expedition more or less in real time no matter how remote the location. And it really wasn't because that's just what you do these days. As, as Mark said, we wanted to create a community of people who would support and eventually hike the trail as we created it. And judging from the size of the audience, I guess it must have worked. <coughs> moving, moving north from Sunik, we performed the same exercise in Vyadzor region. Uh, by this time of year, the mountains were an explosion of wildflowers. Can you imagine what the honey would be like from here? Well, we didn't have to because people kept piling it onto us, <laughs> along with cheese and yogurt and all sorts of homemade delights. We even got given uh, our own house in one village where we mapped out the trails in the region. And this is, this is really the kind of welcome that you can expect in, in the Caucasus. All the same, the region seems even more re remote and isolated than Sunik, and I think that's partly because it was hemmed in by, by the border with Azerbaijan, which is, which is closed. Uh, now, for those of you who are, uh, for the few of you who are unfamiliar with the geopolitics of the South Caucasus, it's not quite like the borderless free-for-all that we're used to here in Europe. In fact, it's a minefield of closed borders and unresolved conflicts. And I'd like to show you a map of exactly what we're up against. Um, so, as well as Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, there are actually three additional self-declared countries in the Caucasus. Abkhazia in the northwest, and then South Ossetia, and then Nagorno-Karabakh. 
Um, none of them are internationally recognized. They're all the cause of long-standing disputes. Because our project is neutral, they're off limits for the trail. Secondly, you can't just cross the borders any way you like. There's only two options crossing from Georgia into Azerbaijan, and only three options between Georgia and Armenia. Finally, there are no border crossings between Armenia and Azerbaijan or Turkey at all. Also, the Azeris hate the Armenians, the Georgians hate the Armenians and the Russians, the Armenians love the Russians, hate the Azeris, distrust the Georgians but love Georgian food, <laughs> and the Iranians love everybody. <laughs> and we think British politics are complicated. Very little of this is apparent on the ground, especially in rural regions, because people tend to just want to live in peace. So none of this need deter the hiker, as long as you know where is off limits. But the reason I mention it is because the Transcaucasian Trail could be a rare opportunity for people who are politically divided to work together on something that transcends these divisions. Pressing north, we entered the Gagarama Mountains. Now, this is a volcanic range of craters in high-altitude steppe down the spine of central Armenia without a single permanent settlement. It's almost Mongolia-like in its wildness. It'll be one of the most challenging parts of the trail, for sure. You'll need to be self-sufficient for several consecutive days. But hikers who rise to this challenge will be in for a real treat. This is the summer home of the Yezidi nomads. Now, the Yezidis are one of Armenia's, well, in fact, they are Armenia's biggest ethnic minority. They live in tents, ride horses. They speak a language related to Kurdish and practice ancient pagan religions. And meeting the Yezidis uh, reminded me how much diversity there is in this corner of the world. There's more than 40 indigenous languages in the Caucasus. In fact, the only places with a higher di uh, density of languages are Papua New Guinea and the Amazon rainforest. <coughs> and I think, I think it's this cultural diversity that will make the Transcaucasian Trail unique among long distance trekking routes. And it's all bound together by this endless Caucasian hospitality. So yeah, let's not forget that there is another main category of trail user, the people who live on the trail. Because we couldn't cross these mountains without passing through or close to villages, nor would we want to. And it's pretty obvious that connecting the needs of hikers with communities who could serve those needs could serve as a new form of income. And this is the kind of thing that sounds great if you work in international development. But I knew from my travels elsewhere that there are many ways to get these kinds of things wrong. What if locals didn't want foreign hikers coming through their villages? Or what if they liked the idea, but no one knew what to do when hikers arrived? And what if new opportunities were monopolized and created conflict? The last thing we wanted the trail to do was disrupt people's lives for the worse. So we made a journey to a place in the Caucasus where we'd heard trail tourism was already successful, Svaneti, in northern Georgia. Brief history lesson. A decade ago, a revolutionary leader called Mikhail Saakashvili rose to power and became president of Georgia. And one of his big visions for the country was tourism. Svaneti was chosen as the new hub of mountain tourism in Georgia, with its provincial capital, Mestia, slated to become the new Chamonix. A very ambitious guy. <coughs> Svaneti had a reputation for colossal mountains, insurmountable peaks, unpredictable weather, and fiercely traditional mountain people. But on a, on a good day, it's actually rather nice. And from pictures like this, I hardly need to explain Svaneti's appeal. And when we arrived in Mestia, we noticed a species that we hadn't seen once since the start of the expedition. Hikers. <laughs> Mestia was swarming with hikers, even though the season wouldn't start properly for another month or so. And it was obvious why. You had signposts, you had trail maps, campsites, guest houses, and above all, actual trails built specifically for hikers. And these are things that you and I probably take for granted, but it's their absence in the rest of the Caucasus that is why more hikers are not coming here. 
we were there to talk to the locals about how all of this had changed their lives. So to do this, we enlisted some help. First, we met up with Becca, the Vice President of Georgia's National Hiking Federation. Marta, who had previously uh, coordinated DFID's programs in the Caucasus. And James, who runs uh, an award-winning responsible tour operator. Our plan was to visit nine villages on an existing trekking route through Upper Svaneti. We would listen to the stories of local people since trail tourism arrived, engage their reactions to the idea of a long distance route bringing more hikers through. <coughs> and what we kept hearing was that this was the first time any, anyone had actually asked them what they thought before developing something. It seemed that in the rush to develop Svaneti, this simple courtesy had been overlooked. Despite that, people were generally in favor of trail tourism. The numbers were now high enough to sustain more than 200 guest houses in those nine villages over the summer. And the income offered insulation against the onslaught of winter and the fragility of mountain, ag uh, mountain agriculture. Older people hoped that the new industry would bring their city-dwelling children back to the villages. On the other hand, there was one village in which we heard a very different story. It turned out that one cunning local bloke who'd been given the job of painting the way marks on the trail had designed the route so that every hiker ended up walking through the front door of his guest house. <laughs> and as the other villagers watched this guy getting richer and richer, buying new cars, etc., they decided they wanted a piece of the action too. The trail multiplied literally overnight and these painted waymarks now went to the front door of everyone else's guest houses too. Intentions were so high, in fact, at this village meeting that it turned into an enormous shouting match at which we very quietly drove away. But the lesson was that it's definitely possible for trails to provide opportunities to people who genuinely do want them. But whatever we did build, we should do it very gently and very sensitively. And we should absolutely prioritize the needs of the people who live on the trail. And I imagine this was the kind of work uh, that would one day become one of the biggest jobs for the trails builders and coordinators. Speaking of trail building, I don't know about you, but before last year, I'd never really thought much about how hiking trails come into existence. The UK has 140,000 miles of public footpaths, which is trails enshrined in law as public rights of way. And you find them everywhere from Hyde Park to the top of Scarfell Pike. But where do they come from? Who maintains them? What, who decides when a new one is needed? And then who goes out and builds it? And until this point, we'd focused on exploring and mapping what was already there, which was a lot of dirt roads and a lot of traditional footpaths. But of course, there had been gaps in the resulting route. Often that was just a few hundred meters or so, but gaps nonetheless. And that often involved things like clambering along very steep hillsides and bushwhacking through forests, which is potentially dangerous for a hiker, but also damaging to the environment. So how would we bridge those gaps? And Paul had a, a very different perspective on this. Because where Paul comes from, the idea of pioneering trails is embedded in the national consciousness. Because to colonize the new world, America's founding fathers literally had to build new trails. And today, it's a normal rite of passage for an outdoor loving young American to join a volunteer crew and work for public benefit on tasks such as trail building and maintenance. So from Paul's perspective, the obvious thing to do was to bring volunteer trail building culture to the Caucasus. While our team were out exploring and mapping, Paul and his friend Jeff were putting together a pilot volunteering program, the first of its kind in the region, to bring people from all over the world to create the very first purpose-built section of the Transcaucasian Trail. So we went to join them. Now, people had come from eight different countries, including Georgia and Armenia. Uh, and the appeal was very obvious. Living in the mountains, sleeping under the stars, getting your hands dirty, all the good stuff. And it was very selfless work. Hikers would probably never even notice what we'd done, taking for granted, as, as we probably do, the ability to walk a safe and unobstructed trail. 
a guy called Jonathan had come out uh, from the US to lead the crew, having spent 10 years working in national parks in the US as a professional trail builder. I had no idea that was an actual job, but apparently it is. And by the end of the first week, we had a brand new section of trail. Everyone had, had a great time, and we'd had a crash course in trail building. And the result was that we returned to our scouting with a new perspective on what a trail building crew could achieve and how those gaps in our route could now be closed. And I think we'd also had a, a really good glimpse of how the building of the Transcaucasian Trail could become a genuine community-driven effort because both the funding and the building had been crowdsourced and the resulting trail handed directly over to the people who lived on it. So as a model for how the rest of the trail might be built, it was really inspiring. We also found a brand new use for Georgina's winch. Now, with the end of summer approaching, uh, we set our sights on Batumi, on the Black Sea coast, which you may remember we passed through earlier. And I really wanted to end the expedition with something symbolic, and I thought that nailing the northern end of the route to match the southern end we'd already explored would be a great way to finish the year. Uh, and the region of Ajara is another fantastic example of the region's diversity. Most of it is actually rainforest. You can find tea, mandarins, even avocados growing there. Uh, it's also one of the biggest bottlenecks in the world for migrating birds of prey, with more than a million counted last year. So now you know. Rainforests are very dense and obviously very wet, which makes an incredibly challenging job for the trail designer. But we'd learned by now that the best place to start was rarely just by plunging into the wilderness. Instead, we went to meet the director of Terala National Park. And as luck would have it, the park were at that very moment planning to extend their existing hiking trail network. This wasn't the first protected area we'd visited. In fact, we'd made it one of our guiding principles to try and connect as many protected areas as possible. Why? Well, properly built trails are a non-intrusive uh, way of using the land. They're an alternative economic use for these protected areas, which is far less destructive than logging, hunting, uh, road building. In other words, if you encourage people to walk through the wilderness, you can actually help protect it. And the park's plans fitted in perfectly. Their new trails would connect the park to a disused dirt road that would in turn lead down to the seaside at Batumi. Heading east, the trails would connect to Kintrishi protected area. And from there, we'd already found a route up to the main Lesser Caucasus Ridge. And along the ridge, we could plan our route all the way east toward Jormi National Park and then south towards the Armenian, Armenian border. And the trails we'd scouted there. Anyway, enough of these pretty pictures. Let's look at the actual data collected on the project. Everyone excited about data? One person. <laughs> so the expedition identified roughly two-thirds of a viable trekking route along the Lesser Caucasus Mountains from the Black Sea to the southern border of Armenia, which includes uh, access routes, side trails, to sites of interest, alternative routes for different seasons. Now, if we include all the trails that didn't make it into that route, that's 5,537 kilometers of new trail data for Georgia and Armenia that didn't exist until last year. And all of that has been added by Alessandro to OpenStreetMap, which is an open source mapping database. In fact, if you have a smartphone, you probably use that database without even realizing it. We also collected uh, 6,374 points of interest, including water sources, potential campsite locations, contacts we've made, and work-related notes for trail builders. As well as that, we took 52,658 geotagged photos to inform our future decisions visually, almost all of which were taken by Vargen. This is the data on which the future of the Transcaucasian Trail will be built. And I really hope that it's been obvious what a gift it's been to have Georgina on this project. As previously mentioned by Mark, BRGS and Landrover offer the bursary every year and anyone can apply. And I feel incredibly privileged 
to have spent a year of my life in this way. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what 2017's winners are going to, use, are going to do with their opportunity. Um, it wouldn't be a proper adventure if everything went to plan, of course. It's possible that we were dragged out of a couple of ditches, um, <laughs> may have been bogged down a couple of times. Um, Alessandro, at one point, got into a fight with a patch of giant hogweed uh, and somehow lost. <laughs> it's, called, it's called phytophotodermatitis, in case you were wondering. But we also rescued quite a few people ourselves, so it all balances out. <laughs> okay, hands up if you're thinking you might one day like to try and hike some of the Transcaucasian Trail. <laughs> well... You'll be, you'll be very pleased to hear that we're opening three major sections of the trail uh, this summer in Svaneti, Sunik, and Dilijan National Park. As well as that, we are going to have our own pop-up visitor centre in Dilijan National Park and also a headquarters in Mestia in Georgia. So if you're feeling intrepid and you fancy being one of the first pioneers of this trail or even helping us build it, then we invite you to come and join us this summer. The best way to keep up to date with these opportunities uh, is to join our email newsletter and Facebook page, which you can either do now or I will email everyone on Eventbrite uh, tomorrow with some quick instructions. <coughs> As for what the team are going to go on to do this year, Alessandro is teaming up with Jeff to create some brand new topographical maps of the Caucasus. Um, James and Marta are currently looking for trustees for a new UK charity, which will fundraise for the project. Uh, Paul is going to organise a second trail ribbon camp in Georgia uh, to work on the trail in Svaneti and the neighbouring province of Racha. And Vargan is going to run the first volunteer trail ribbon camp in Armenia, based in Dilijan. <coughs> As for me, well, I don't like leaving things unfinished. So at the end of this month, I'm going back out to the Caucasus for a second year. And the bursary has helped us achieve an enormous amount. And I really hope that you've been sufficiently inspired to help me continue this work in 2017. As expeditions go, this has been remarkably inexpensive. In fact, if everyone in this room right now donated just £10 on their way out, that would be enough to finish what we started. And the first contribution has already been made by Land Rover, who have very generously agreed to let Georgina stay with, with me for another year. So thank you so much. For that. So there is a donation box cunningly positioned by the exit of the building. And there'll be, there'll be some lovely volunteers there taking card donations. Uh, your support would mean so much to me and the team. And my biggest wish of all is that one day you'll be able to enjoy what you've helped create when you hike the Transcaucasian Trail yourself. Thank you. Um, my name's Shane Windsor, and I look after particularly the overseas and challenging expeditions here at the Society. And together with my colleague Anna, please stand up, Anna. Um, we have worked with Tom, <laughs> Anna from Jaguar, and seen this project blossom. Um, and of course, the Society is hugely proud of the bursary and the bursary winners who've all brought a different thing, different stages to it. But this expedition would not have been possible without a huge number of people, members of various times. So it would be wonderful if those of you from the Transcaucasian Trail involved in the expedition would come onto the stage and then we're going to take questions 
from you, the audience. So, shall we have the team back up on the stage? So I'm sure you're all desperate to go and have a drink in the bar, but you might have some questions. And we've got some roving mics, but would anyone like to ask the first question? Over you there, sir. Um, my name is John Roberts, and I've been to Georgia and Azerbaijan and indeed Armenia quite a few times. Um, I can imagine that you have put in great efforts to coordinate both a north-south and an east-west trail. But how much of a problem do you have in creating an east-west trail given the tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan? <laughs> Who would like to answer that one? It's a really difficult question. Um, we have actually made some leads in Azerbaijan. Um, it hasn't been the focus this year, but uh, we have some contacts there who've been providing us with data on the trails and seem willing to be involved. Um, so we're, we're very optimistic that this can happen despite the tensions. And we're going to proceed as if that is the case. We, we really have no choice. Also, the east-west route um, from Georgia to Azerbaijan uh, was crossed through Lidia in far eastern Georgia. There's a national park called Magadeti, which is a really beautiful, it's one of the oldest forests in Georgia. And it actually borders a uh, national park in Azerbaijan. And those two national parks have actually been talking for a while about trying to do some transboundary uh, cooperation. And uh, we're hoping that, you know, with this idea and this, this uh, catalyst that we're providing, hopefully we can keep those conversations going and maybe develop a trail that crosses uh, through that border crossing there between Georgia and Azerbaijan. And the ambassador from Georgia said that's no problem. So. <laughs> We wanted to build partnerships with the Georgian and Armenian government, so I can only speak for Georgia, but uh, one of the first things we did, we built partnerships with the Georgian Hiking Feder National Hiking Federation and the GNTA, which is Georgian National Tourism Administration, so it's the Georgian government, so we, um, we've got a formal partnership with them to support the trail and support our work. Uh, we also had a tremendous um, support from the Georgian Embassy in London as well from the very, very beginning of the, of the, the, the project. Um, so we're really hoping to carry on working together and um, uh, extend the, uh, the cooperation. And I think you guys started some work with the Armenian authorities as well, so maybe you can, you can talk about it. So uh, the authorities know that it's a very um, interesting region, but very often they need some additional help, like some advice. For example, about the trail building, it appears that there are many initiatives to develop tourism, but not many of them have been mentioning that the trail has to be built in, uh, in order to be uh, promoted well and so that, to invite more people. So we're happy to say that very often we're the first ones in the country to mention the trail building as a something very important and uh, now it seems to be working slowly but it's it started working somehow because the government pays attention and uh, they invite for uh, consultations and we participate very often so I see. there's a question under the balcony the lady in uh, turquoise So the question was, uh, how many miles and how long would it take? And I think the answer might be little parts, but I'll hand that over to Tom. How fast you walk? <laughs> it's, um, 
the, the two trails together we think are going to be in the region of two to two and a half thousand miles. Uh, so each one between a thousand and maybe 1,250 miles long. It's going to be a good summer's walk. Let's put it like that. <laughs> Do we have any questions in the balcony? Yes, sir. Uh, your photographs make it all look quite mild out there. Can you tell us about the temperatures and when the weather makes it a bit better at night? Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's going to be a seasonal window for specific parts of the trail. I mean, the higher, higher altitude parts in both Armenia and Georgia are really only accessible from July onwards if you want to be sure that there's going to be no snow there. And even then, you never quite know. Um, but other parts of the trail, the season, the season will be a lot longer. So it may be that, as I said in the talk, we will provide alternative routes at lower elevations for if the season is unfavorable in one particular year. Um, I'd say that in all, you've got roughly May to October to, to explore those mountains. Yeah, and the greater part of is a little bit later, like July through September, just because of snow on the passes. Um, but uh, I'm going to teach her in Spanish in a couple weeks, and you know, I encourage you all to, to keep learning them. <laughs> we, know, we know it's possible to do it in the winter as well. We met someone doing a consultation with the nephew who did the trail cross country skiing last, last January. So it's was there a question at the back of the balcony? The lady in the camel coat. Can you stand up and shout? Because we, I didn't think we've got a... There's a question up at the top right. Can I just follow up? Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's a three week collaborative project. So uh, it's based in enthusiast conservation and hunting circles. Uh, we can spot them if we're into our wildflowers. Uh, we welcome anyone with geology expertise to tour them. So if anyone wants to get involved and help collate this information and make it available to the public, uh, please approach us. We'll be more than happy to uh, add more team members. Apart from the hostile hog wind, <laughs> the hostile animal. I think I was going to say the, I think the, the main thing to worry about in Armenia is, is snakes, and that's just a case of knowing what to do and how to make sure that they're not going to be standing in your path when you walk past, um, and also exactly which specific regions they're endemic to. Everybody always warns me about the wolves. They're like, the wolves, the wolves, the issue, but. I never saw any wolves. There are a few hundred wolves, but the, the sheepdogs in Georgia and Armenia are really mm -hmm. protective of their herd. So uh, you have to learn how to deal with those sheepdogs as well. So I think we have a young questioner as well at the top of the aisle. Do you have a question? Um, are there parts of the trail that would be suitable for bike packing? Bike packing or bike? Bike, bike or bike? Bicycle touring. Yeah, the, um, the Lesser Caucasus lends itself much better to mountain biking, and I personally would love to see that happen and plan to dedicate quite a lot of my energy to finding a mountain bike friendly version of the trail. Um, so, yeah, in other words, it will eventually happen. Got one question. 
Behind you, behind you. Hi. Uh, just thinking about what you ate, how much did you rely on stuff that you were cooking yourself and how much did you rely on the local hospitality that, that you found along the way? So the question's about the local food. Well, on the expedition, we didn't rely on local hospitality at all. That, I think that would be... Um, that, that, that wouldn't be right to expect that we'd be fed by people. So we always carried enough food for, you know, a week or so. Um, and stocking up at village shops is relatively simple. But having said that, whenever we did turn up in a village, we were always welcomed with open arms and ended up being fed. And as I said, we were overloaded with honey and cheese. And I think we've even still got some cheese left. <laughs> Well, I think we might... Uh, would you like a burning question there? You're waving. The question was about sanitation. Well, there's... I mean, you're, you're better off answering this than me, I think. <laughs> I've never been very... I've never been very, very sanitary. <laughs> But you're really clean, aren't you? There's so many uh, springs <laughs> in the Caucasus. It's crazy. It's like every you know, 100 feet you come across a natural spring. And yeah, I'm not thinking about water. I'm thinking about natural. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's part of a bigger idea of trying to introduce this leave no trace principles to the region. Um, and, you know, on backcountry hikes, what people will do is bring a, bring a, sh a shovel and, you know, you take out what you bring in. Um, to put it delicately, <laughs> or you, or you bury it with you know a particular set of guidelines on how deep and, and all that kind of stuff. So we'll build all of that education into the resources that we create. Good. Well, I think sadly I'm going to have to draw an end to the questions now, but we will be able to. The whole of the, the ground floor of the building will be open. There will be several bars, so I'm sure you can come and talk to the team individually. But I'd like to hand over to the president of the Royal Geographical Society with IBG for the vote of thanks. Thank you, President. A, free, a few very brief words. It gives me enormous uh, pleasure as president of uh, RGS IBG to congratulate Tom and his extraordinary team um, uh, for the successful execution of their expedition and for an incredibly inspiring lecture. I'm sure we're all sitting here itchy-footed. I certainly am waiting to head off to the Caucasus. Expeditions like this are team events, uh, and as we've seen on behalf of RGS IBG, I'd like to thank Jaguar Land Rover for their support in this, their 10th year of the Land Rover bursary. And equally importantly... <laughs> and equally importantly, uh, Ambassador, um, because no expedition can succeed without the goodwill of its hosts. I'd like to thank the governments of Georgia and Armenia for supporting this remarkable geographical enterprise. Thank you. And I'm sure you'll all uh, want to join me in wishing Tom and his burgeoning team every success with their continuing endeavor. Good luck. Finally, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. I hope you continue to be engaged with the trail and all it offers for those who both want to physically go and join and volunteer with the team and support its continuing work, or if you stay in the UK and follow them online and all their achievements. Please do make your way to the bar. I'm just going to invite those who were part of the team to just come and have a classic team photo, and that includes the supporters from Land Rover and the RGS IBG. But please feel free to make your way to the, door, uh, to the bars, and we'll join you there in a minute. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you.